We are uh, very enthusiastic to have such an enthusiastic audience today, and uh, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Samuel Myers, who is currently at the Harvard School of Public Health. He's a, a physician, uh, graduated from Yale, then uh, went to uh, UCSF, I guess, for his house training, et cetera and then started exploring his uh, international interests, worked at USAID at the uh, Conservation uh, International, and after several years of that, uh, has gone to uh, Harvard School of Public Health, gotten a master's, and is a staff member there who is, whose research is, I would say, fairly broad-based, although it fits under a very uh, a neat umbrella. He's interested in the uh, effect of the environment on human health, as you know, but his research projects range quite uh, remarkably. One is looking at the uh, impact of landscape fires, large fires, on health in Southeast Asia. And you may not have to travel so far uh, to continue uh, to gain insights there, given these tremendous California fires. Uh, he's been interested and is actively researching the impact of access to fisheries and their products, uh, their foods, on human health. And probably most relevant to uh, this group is the impact of the rising CO2 level on the nutrient content of grains and other food uh, stuffs, other plants. This is a very uh, interesting and scary uh, uh, area in a sense, uh, with iron and zinc being uh, most strongly implicated, but I bet you there are other nutrients that will fall into line just behind them. So today, uh, uh, we thank you, Sam, for taking time out of your very busy schedule and to share some of your uh, research findings and impressions uh, on this topic. Thank you very much. All right, well, Bess, thank you. Um, and it's really a, a treat to get to be here with, uh, with all of you today and uh, anybody who's uh, watching the live stream. Um, I imagine that uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is a little bit uh, far afield for um, some of you. Uh, so I hope you'll uh, bear with me, but my plan is to um, start by kind of zooming way out and giving you a little sense of um, how uh, biophysical conditions on the planet are actually changing much more rapidly than ever before in the history of our species. Um, and that's then raising these questions around what the implications may be for our own health and uh, in particular for today, our nutrition. And then uh, I want to zoom in and talk very specifically about the research that our group is doing in a few different areas that relate to nutrition. Uh, and then come back out again and, and think with you about what all of that might uh, actually mean. So on Christmas Eve in 1968, uh, Bill Anders looked out the window of the first manned spacecraft ever to orbit the moon and took this uh, photograph of Earth rising up above the moon's horizon. And it was the first time that a human being had been far enough away from our planet to see it as a separate entity, whole and distinct. And it was breathtaking. Anders would write later, we came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth, which is an interesting uh, thought. And the same sort of awesome technological mastery that propelled human beings to the moon was also fueling this extraordinary expansion of our global ecological footprint, the sum total of human impacts across our planet's natural systems and resources. Around the same time that Anders and other Apollo astronauts were 
coming home with these iconic images of Earth from space, we were entering a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, in which human activity had become the dominant force shaping our planet's biophysical conditions. So we're now, we find ourselves in this period that Stefan and his colleagues have called the Great Acceleration, where our impact across our planet's biophysical conditions are intensifying almost exponentially. Let me show you what I mean. So whether we're looking at uh, human appropriation of fresh water, uh, proliferation of motor vehicles, uh, production and use of synthetic fertilizers, production of paper and plastic, or primary energy use. What you see are these graphs that look very similar with this relatively modest impact before you know, 1900, 1950, and then this almost exponential rise in the sum total of our consumption practices as a species. And not surprisingly, similar graphs that look at our impact across natural systems have a very similar shape. So whether you're looking at biodiversity loss or uh, appropriation of global fisheries or addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, acidification of the oceans, or loss of tropical forests, you see these similar patterns. And we could have you know, 10 or 15 more similar kinds of graphs. They'd all have that shape. So, Perhaps not surprisingly, this great acceleration has led to what Gus Speth has called the great collision between humanity and our planet's natural systems. Driven by these rapid increases in human population and even steeper growth in per capita consumption patterns, the total sort of scale of human impacts across natural systems is really hard to overstate. So, Annually, in order to feed ourselves, we've converted about 40% of the terrestrial land, sur land surface for croplands and pasture. We use about half the accessible fresh water on the planet, mostly to irrigate our crops. We're using and fishing 90% of monitored fisheries at or beyond their uh, maximum sustainable limits. In the process, we've cut down somewhere between 7 and 11 million square kilometers of the world's forests dammed around 60% of its rivers and are producing growing problems with air and water and soil pollution. The result of these and many other processes is dramatic loss of species at about 1,000 times the baseline rate and significant reductions in the population size, about a 50% reduction in the population sizes of mammals, birds, fishes, uh, amphibians, and reptiles in just the last 45 years. So paradoxically, right, despite these really deeply concerning trends, um, most uh, measures of human health have been uh, improving. Right? So uh, just you know, since 1950, we've seen life expectancy go from 47 up to 69. Child mortality has been uh, plummeting uh, despite uh, these trends of environmental degradation. So how do we reconcile that? And in uh, 2015, there is a commission put together by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet called the Commission on Planetary Health. And we addressed this question um, in the commissioned report in 2015 uh, really head on. And we said that this ecological paradox um, uh, that we were deeply concerned that the explanation is straightforward and sobering that we have been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize economic and development gains in the present. But by unsustainably exploiting nature's resources, human civilization has flourished, but now risks substantial health effects from the de degradation of nature's life support systems in the future. So essentially, we were flagging this enormous issue of intergenerational equity, right? That we are uh, reaping the benefits of unsustainable resource use today while we defer the costs of degraded systems to future generations. So just as you know, over the last couple of decades, we've become much more aware that there are really important social and cultural and political determinants of human health, we're also becoming aware that there are really important ecological determinants of health, that indeed 
human health is nested in a set of environmental conditions and the rapid change in those conditions uh, can have important impacts to health. So if we think about nutrition, which is what most of you are focused on, there's sort of this dizzying array of, of pathways by which changing environmental conditions, changes in the climate system, in the amount of arable land, in the quality of air and air pollution, in availability and quality of water, in uh, the population size and distribution of species in different systems, fisheries, temperature, all can interact to affect the quality and the quantity of food that we can produce. Another way of thinking about this um, is this sort of schematic for planetary health. And this whole conversation that we're having is going to fit inside the, this concept of planetary health, which has just been emerging over the last uh, couple of years. And the, the core premise of planetary health is that as a result of rapid growth in human population and other demographic shifts, uh, even steeper increases in, in per capita consumption and changes in technology, that the sort of sum total of the demands that we're putting on our planet for to provide resources and to absorb our wastes really exceed, at this point, our planet's capacity. And the result is that we're seeing these you know, more and more uh, rapid changes in core large-scale biophysical uh, systems from uh, global pollution to biodiversity loss to alterations in biogeochemical cycles like nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus. Uh, to changes in land use and land cover, uh, scarcity of resources like arable land and fresh water, uh, and disruption of the climate system. And that all of these uh, rapidly changing conditions are actually interacting with each other in complex ways that we're just beginning to get a glimpse at understanding to alter these sort of proximate conditions for human health, to alter the quality of air, the quality and quantity of food, our exposure to infectious disease, access to fresh water, exposure to natural hazards, and that these in turn affect just about every dimension of human health. That which populations are most affected actually depends to a certain extent on these mediating factors, that some populations are more vulnerable than others based on their access to good governance, wealth, philanthropy, et cetera. But that fundamentally, these changes are driving important impacts across health. And so, of course, uh, today we're going to focus on uh, nutrition. So just a teeny little bit more background, which I feel silly giving to all of you because you could do this better than I can. But um, very quickly, we know that nutrition is still obviously an enormous problem driving enormous or malnutrition driving enormous burdens of disease around the world, affecting large numbers of people, both undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, or pandemic of metabolic diseases. When we think about meeting future demand, um, most studies project that we're going to need to increase global food production on the order of 70 to 100 percent over the next 40 to 50 years in order to keep up with projected demand arising from this combination of uh, population growth, economic growth, which is allowing more people to eat more calories, and this transition to Western-style diets, which are less efficient uh, in terms of what people are eating. Uh, on the supply side, uh, we have just a whole bunch of question marks. We know right now we've been diverting a certain amount of grain into biofuels. It's unclear exactly where that's going to go. Uh, there are significant production challenges, which I'm going to be talking a lot about. Uh, and then there's this enormous capacity for innovation and new work, which many of you all are involved in, and how that shakes out uh, is a little bit unclear. But the point is that right now we're having a hard time providing nutritious diets to large parts of the global population, and we are facing some significant challenges in terms of the need to increase uh, global food production. So that puts us in the situation of this sort of Gordian knot of food security. So across the top are uh, these factors that are driving increased demand for food. And then all around here are essentially a set of biophysical changes which represent challenges to either the quality or the quantity of food we can produce. Things that are related to climate change, issues around air pollution. Uh, I'm going to talk about CO2 and nutrient content, some of these biological changes natural disasters, et cetera. And so there's 
just to say that we're in this moment of time where we need to increase global food production as steeply as ever before in human history while we're altering condition after condition around the planet much more quickly than we ever have in the history of our species, and that puts us in an interesting uh, place. This is just a, a graph from an old uh, science uh, issue on food security from 2010, but the point here is simply that if you look at historic increases in food production at the heart of the Green Revolution, when we are increasing food production much more rapidly than ever before in history, it was this unbelievable success, right? And you project those forward into the future, and you ignore the fact that most of the things that we did in the Green Revolution have kind of been tapped out, whether it's you know, new hybrid varieties or mechanization or the use of irrigation for agriculture or uh, synthetic fertilizers. Certainly they can be extended in certain parts of the world where they haven't fully penetrated, but a lot of the gain that we can get from those interventions has been gotten. But if you ignore that and you say we're still back at the steep part of the slope from the beginning of the Green Revolution and you project that forward, you actually don't even get quite where we need to get. That we actually need to get uh, increased food production even more rapidly than we did during the Green Revolution in the context of these additional headwinds. So it's a, it's a significant challenge that we face, as you all know. All right, so let me zoom in. Enough of that. Um, that's context. And talk very specifically about our group's um, research in three different areas. And as best mentioned, um, one of those is looking at how rising concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide are affecting uh, the nutritional quality of staple food crops. Um, the second is looking at the impact of declines in insect pollinators uh, for populations around the world. And the third is focused um, on fisheries. So our CO2 work uh, started with um, you know, a sort of uh, esoteric and somewhat contentious uh, literature in some fairly obscure journals that I couldn't even get at Harvard. There are journals, you probably have them here actually, but um, there are journals of crop science. They're much more sort of the agronomy uh, literature. And w people had been growing uh, in the 1990s uh, crops in artificial uh, conditions in chambers and greenhouses and seeing these um, interesting uh, alterations in the nutrient profile of those crops. And so this is um, a meta-analysis from Taub et al. from 2008, where uh, the number of studies is in parentheses for each of these different crops. And you see this is for protein. Um, these pretty significant reductions in the amount of protein in most of these, except for uh, soybean, uh, in most of these food crops. And uh, there is some other literature um, suggesting this is sort of a little uh, meta-analysis that caught my eye that um, was interesting to me as a physician, uh, particularly because of these two, iron and zinc. And you see uh, the yellow is in uh, wheat grains. And you see these you know, really pretty dramatic um, reductions just across two or three cultivars of wheat from small studies. Um, uh, so it wasn't definitive. But boy, if that's real, right, that you're getting these huge reductions of iron and zinc in, in a really important food crop like wheat, it was worth taking notice. And so I got interested in this and um, very quickly discovered that the plant physiologists were kind of arguing with the agronomists about it and were saying, you know, I'm not sure that this is real. Maybe this is just an artifact of these artificial growing conditions. These are pot effects. We're not, you know, sure that we really believe it. Um, and it seemed like this was a question that needed to be resolved. And so. Um, I put together sort of a, a coalition of people that actually know about crops, um, these agronomists growing uh, these six staple uh, food crops in uh, locations around the world on three different continents. Um, and um, we together um, built a, a data set over time of growing 41 different cultivars of these six uh, staple food crops on seven sites on three continents. Um, and that gave us a, and it was a, done over 10 years, so it was 10 years of data. Um, and so it gave us a large enough data set to have the statistical significance to really answer this question. And that was one of the big problems in the literature, in addition to the artificial growing conditions, was this issue of sample size and you know not coming from an agricultural background at all 
Um, it took me a while to even figure out what N meant in agronomy research. And it turns out that N is this absurdly hard thing to achieve because you, know, you can run an entire experiment for a whole year and with growing two different plants under totally different conditions and you can grow you know, 30 of those plants and that gives you an N of one. Um, and so you know, realizing that and thinking, well, so how do you get statistical power? It turns out you've got to do something like this. And so there hadn't been a lot of statistical power in the previous examples, I mean, the previous literature. And the other thing, as I said, was that there were artificial growing conditions. And so going back, um, what these folks are doing in these different experiments is what's called face experiments. I don't know, how many of you know what face experiments are here? Okay, so not a ton. Um, so FACE stands for free air carbon dioxide enrichment, and it's become the gold standard for how you evaluate the effect of different carbon dioxide concentrations on crops. And the advantage is that these are open field conditions. And so these rings are rings of carbon dioxide emitting jets, and in the middle of a ring will be a CO2 sensor and a wind direction sensor. And so as the CO2 falls below its prescribed level, which in our case was 550 parts per million, which is where the world's expected to be the middle of this century in about 40 or 50 years. Um, when it falls below that level, the upwind jets blow out a little more CO2, and that way you can actually maintain very specific carbon dioxide levels in these open field conditions where the cultivar inside this ring is identical to the one outside, uh, and they're experiencing the same weather and soil conditions and pests and pathogens and all of that. And so it's a way to isolate the CO2 effect uh, very uh, directly. And so when we did that and we got this large sample size, we were actually able to definitively answer this question about whether rising CO2 did pose a threat uh, to nutrition. And um, what we found were these you know, pretty significant reductions, um, as Beth said, in iron and zinc, and um, overall, uh, that for uh, all C3 crops that we studied, we saw uh, significant reductions in iron and zinc. For the C3 grains like wheat and rice, we also saw uh, significant reductions in protein, whereas the legumes seem to be protected from that uh, protein effect, presumably because they metabolize nitrogen in a completely different way. Um, and it was worrisome. Um, and the reason it was worrisome is that there were about 2.7 uh, billion people around the world who uh, live in these 50 countries which receive at least 70% of their dietary zinc and or iron from the kinds of crops that were losing uh, those nutrients. And we know that we have a baseline of somewhere around 2 billion people who are already deficient in iron and zinc at a very large uh, cost in terms of burden of disease. And so we've got a big public health problem, and we've got a lot of people depending on these crops for their nutrients, and the crops are losing their nutrients. So the next question after we published this first paper was the sort of, so what question? You know, can we actually really define what this means for people um, and not just plants? You know, what is the risk of zinc deficiency among different populations as a result of this particular effect. And so um, we took our data, we combined it with all the other published data from similar kinds of experiments on the edible portion of food crops and did a little meta-analysis just to determine an effect size, which didn't really change our numbers much at all, but it incorporated a little bit more data and a few more crops. And then we, we got an estimated effect size, sort of how much will 550 parts per million CO2 alter the nutrient profile of these crops. So <laughs> the next thing that I thought would be easy, and turns out it took an enormous amount of work, was to go to this table that I was sure must exist of what everybody eats all over the world and what the nutrient content of those foods are. And, um, it turns out that that table doesn't exist. Um, you know, when you're trained in medicine, you're used to these really comprehensive tables. You know, every different, you know, chemistry related to the kidney function and liver function, you can find it all. Well, not so much for global nutrition, I guess. And so um, we had a sort of two to three year diversion where we ended up building something 
uh, called the Global Expanded Nutrient Supply Database with colleagues here at Tufts, including Dari uh, Mazafarian. Um, and essentially what we did was to take the, starting with the FAO food balance sheet data, which is kind of all we had for a global database. Um, we then took the 86 food categories that were in that database and we disaggregated them to 225 using a whole lot of um, trade, uh, trade data that we actually ended up looking at agricultural census data from different countries and slowly kind of figuring out what fruit NOS actually meant from you know, Tanzania, and um, by looking at what was produced in the trade data. And so we disaggregated them to more food groups, right? Um, so we ended up with 225 food groups for these 152 countries that we could get the good trade data, which was most of the global population. And then we um, used regional food composition databases to actually look at the nutrient content of each one of those 225 foods for 23 different nutrients. Uh, and then we worked with DARI's group and the Global Dietary Database to impute um, the distributions of those foods by age and sex uh, for populations around the world to create these 23 uh, age and sex groups. And so, um, Putting all of that together, we have uh, not very high quality, but the best quality available estimates of um, what people are eating by age and sex across these different foods and what's in those foods. Um, and there's still a ton more to do, which uh, we're trying to work on right now to improve that database uh, significantly. So that's the thing, the tool, that we needed at the heart of the next set of analyses we wanted to do because we wanted to ask if those foods start at you know, X milligrams of zinc per gram and go to Y, what does that mean for the total intake of that nutrient for a five-year-old girl in Mali? Um, and is she now at risk for uh, deficiency? And so um, using that kind of data, um, we published a paper in 2015 where we estimated uh, the risk of zinc deficiency for populations around the world based on this effect. And we found that somewhere around 150 to 200 million people would be pushed into new onset of uh, risk of zinc deficiency in addition to the billion or so people whose zinc deficiency would be uh, exacerbated. And much more recently, just last summer, uh, we published these two additional papers looking at protein and iron. Uh, for protein, we used a sort of similar kind of methodology, although there are all kinds of horrible um, questions about uh, how many people are truly protein deficient and what that really means. And we tried to get into that literature and lost our minds and decided, all right, we're not going to even try to say what that means in terms of health because we're not the experts and we'll just get ourselves into all kinds of horrible arguments. But um, what we are going to say is how many people are pushed below uh, the EAR, the estimated average requirement of protein for that country as a result of this CO2 effect and we'll let the experts decide what that actually means in health terms. But we found uh, similar kinds of numbers of around 150 million people being pushed into new onset protein deficiency. Um, particularly uh, in South Asia and also in Northern Africa based on their uh, diets. And with iron, it's even thornier, as you guys know better than I do. Um, the absorption of iron is enormously complicated, uh, and bioabsorption and all the different uh, things that inhibit or enable it, uh, including infectious disease status as well as what they're eating. So we, again, walked away from all of that debate. And what we calculated was Essentially, we asked, what's our vulnerable population? And so for iron deficiency, uh, children under five and women of childbearing age are the most at risk for iron deficiency. We asked how many people in those two categories are living in countries which already have high rates of anemia, greater than 20%, and are in our highest tertile of loss of dietary iron from the CO2 effect. And we were startled to find that the answer was 1.4 billion women and children met that criteria. So 1.4 billion uh, women and children around the world are living in places with anemia rates greater than 20% and will lose more than 3.8% of their dietary iron as a result of the CO2 effect um, itself. 
So that's the CO2 story. Um, and I'm sure you'll have questions that we can talk about. Um, the second quick story is about pollinator decline. So um, just as we're adding lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we are um, changing uh, the habitat and the forage available for uh, animal, particularly insect uh, pollinators. And there had been uh, a few studies out there looking at this um, connection, which had essentially shown that um, pollinator dependent crops are providing large chunks of global calories in the human diet. Uh, and then there was another study showing that um, pollinator dependent crops provided an outsized uh, chunk of the nutrients in the human diet. Um, but really, th th there's sort of a, a larger question, which is that's a problem only if you meet uh, a couple of criteria, right? That's a problem if you're living relatively near a threshold of insufficiency of some nutrient or food commodity. Um, and you're depending for your intake of that nutrient or food group on pollinator dependent crops. And so these broad studies that just said these crops are important for calories didn't really help us to analyze who's at risk, how many people really meet those criteria. And so that was the nature of what we were, uh, what we were trying to do. And we were looking at um, essentially five uh, outcomes. So we were looking at um, vitamin A and folate intake, which seemed to be particularly pollinator dependent. We'd done an earlier pilot study in four countries and really sort of tried to understand which nutrients pollinators were most important for, and vitamin A and folate really jumped out. And then we were intrigued by the latest global burden of disease analyses, which suggested that insufficient intake of fruits uh, vegetables and nuts and seeds were associated with really large burdens of disease because of losing this prophylactic effect for non-communicable diseases like heart disease and stroke and some cancers. Um, and so we looked at those five different outcomes, vitamin A, folate, and insufficient intake of fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds. Um, so the things that we needed to know to get started were what people eat and what's in it. So we used the genus database for that. Um, the pollinator dependence of each food crop, which it turns out all these ecologists had come together and built this fabulous database that gives you the pollinator dependence of each food crop. Um, and then these scenarios for how much pollinators were uh, declining, and we used what's called the EAR cut point method, the same thing we'd done with zinc uh, and protein to look at vitamin A and folate, and then we worked with colleagues again here at Tufts who'd been involved in the global burden of disease calculations for the uh, fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds to recreate um, those calculations under these other scenarios. And um, this is a paper that we published uh, in 2015. Um, and what's interesting is this is really vitamin A and folate. This is, you know, and you get communicable disease because of the risks of those things, particularly from vitamin A deficiency. Um, and so you see these you know, significant burdens of disease kind of in the places that, in planetary health anyway, we're used to seeing burdens of disease. You know, lower income countries, it stinks to be poor, same old story, these people are vulnerable. But what was even more interesting to me was what happened when you looked at the loss of these prophylactic food groups. And here you're seeing these really big vulnerabilities in other parts of the world related to loss of uh, fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds. And so overall, we found you know, on the order of around 100 million people being pushed into vitamin A and folate deficiencies, uh, an absolute loss of pollinator services, which hopefully is nowhere in our near future, uh, that would lead to 1.4 million excess deaths annually. And it was pretty linear when we projected what happens at 50% you know, loss of pollinators. And then from a policy standpoint, I was really interested in understanding, you know, so, so what do people do with this? Like, who's got global pollinator as, you know, their sort of purview? You know, no one really sees that as in their manageable interest. But if you could say at the country level what it means for you to lose your indigenous pollinator population for your own health, that might actually be more persuasive. And I was also curious how much of the health effect of pollinator declines 
is coming from loss of pollinators here in our own country versus among our trade partners. And as a you know, Bostonian, I sort of assume most of it's trade, right? It's gonna be, it doesn't really matter what happens locally because I've never eaten anything that's grown near Boston, or that's not quite true, but very rarely. Um, but it turns out that I'm an anomaly and that in fact 82% of the burden of disease from pollinator declines comes from in-country uh, pollinator declines. And so we ended up publishing a table for every country of the 152 countries showing what the global burden of disease would be associated with loss of pollinator services within that country so that policymakers could make an argument about you know, restoring habitat or forage or banning neonicotinoid pesticides or whatever thing it was that they thought would help based on there being some health dividends as well as uh, ecological dividends. Okay, um, cognizant that we're running out of time, um, very briefly, uh, we're doing uh, a similar exploration of global fisheries declines. And um, in a nutshell, um, this work is much more preliminary, so I don't have a lot of results to share with you. Um, but for the last couple of years with my uh, colleague Chris Golden, who's been helping to lead this effort, um, we're looking at the fact that um, a combination of overfishing and ocean warming from climate change and ocean acidification are really dramatically changing the population sizes and distributions of fisheries all over the world. And we're working with uh, fisheries ecologists and economists and nutritional epidemiologists to put together a model that essentially looks at how those population sizes and distributions of fish are going to be changing over time with a bioeconometric model in the middle that looks at price elasticities of different fish and all of that and then asks for different countries what this might mean for um, access to fish and the diet and what that then would mean for nutritional outcomes. And so it's a complicated effort to start linking things like climate change and ocean warming to nutritional outcomes in particular populations. The first, um, I'm gonna skip that. Well, this is just interesting, right? So this is William Chung's work that's um, this is what I mean about changes in population size and distribution. So these are like 50% in the bright red uh, reductions in fisheries. And you know, if you look at where they're occurring, right, it's all across the tropics, which is probably the place where fish are most important as a source of not only protein, but a whole variety of micronutrients. And then this redistribution of fish um, up towards the poles, which incidentally is the same thing that's happening to agricultural production. Um, so we published a paper last year, uh, and essentially it was, it was similar in the sense of doing a vulnerability analysis. So we, again, we asked how many people in the world are living near a threshold of nutrient insufficiency and are depending on wild harvested fish for large components of that nutrient. And the answer was about a billion people around the world meet uh, those criteria for things like iron and zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, B12. So wild harvested fish are super important and not just for protein. And if people lose access, particularly in the tropics, that's gonna be problematic unless, unless we can substitute with, with something else equally nutritious. We're doing a whole deep dive in Makira and Madagascar in the Makira protected area, which is much more in-depth look at a 750 subjects and doing serum analysis and anthropometry and wildlife trapping, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, so let's zoom back out again, um, the big picture. So I've been talking, right, about this little piece of the larger topic of climate change, right? This is a direct effect of CO2 on crop nutrients. There's obviously a huge, much broader topic of how climate change is gonna affect agricultural yields and impact nutrition. And then a few areas where we've been doing research around, this is in, in Madagascar, the wildlife declines and pollinators and fisheries. And there are obviously you know, a whole host of other uh, environmental changes around water scarcity, land degradation that are also affecting quality and quantity of food, in addition to surprises. Like who 15 years ago would have guessed that adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere was gonna make our food less nutritious? And we can anticipate 
more of those kinds of surprises as we alter the, the sort of fundamental biophysical conditions that underpin our food production system. And of course, you know, this is one dimension of human health, but one of the things I work on as somebody really interested in planetary health and this broader framing is that, boy, across almost every dimension of health, non-communicable disease, infectious disease, displacement, conflict, mental health, there are also really important impacts of rapidly changing environmental conditions on those dimensions of health. A few um, overarching themes that um, hopefully kind of come out of these uh, stories. The first is surprise. So, um, you know, it, it is, as I say, hard to anticipate that adding carbon dioxide to our atmosphere would make our food less nutritious. This is another story that came out last year where um, the combination of sort of poor water resource management and damming as well as sea level rise and more intense storms associated with climate change have led to more saltwater intrusion into the aquifer in Bangladesh. And there's been some really interesting research now showing that um, the incidence of uh, preeclampsia in pregnant women in Bangladesh is directly correlated to the salinity of their groundwater, um, as is the incidence of hypertension among coastal uh, both men and women in Bangladesh. And so not necessarily directly nutrition, but a close cousin of nutrition in terms of salt intake and health impacts related to environmental change. That would have been a hard thing to anticipate that sea level rise was going to drive preeclampsia in Bangladeshi women. A second theme is winners and losers, and this is true across planetary health. Often the things that are changing the environmental conditions are being done because they're to somebody's benefit, either financially or for some other uh, way. This is a story about upland Belize farmers. So these guys are adding a whole bunch of fertilizer to their fields to grow their crops, which is great for them, important for people that are you know, eating those crops. But it turns out that the runoff from those crops is going into waterways and traveling hundreds of miles down to lowland Belize, where it's triggering an ecological change. It's altering the reedy vegetation in these, these typhal uh, systems and changing that vegetation in a way that actually favors a switch from a mosquito called Anopheles albuminus to a different mosquito called Anopheles vestipanus. These are important because Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria, and vestipanus is a much more efficient transmitter of malaria to humans than albuminus. So, you know, completely unwittingly, right, these guys are putting their compatriots down in lowland Belize at higher risk of malaria. And these are the kinds of stories that come out of planetary health all the time. The last sort of overarching theme is that I think this kind of research puts us in a slightly new ethical um, terrain. You know, for the first time we can see in a very quantifiable, very direct way um, that every decision that we uh, make about how to get around, or what we eat, how many children we're going to have, where we travel for vacation, affects the health and well-being of everybody else on the planet, both present and uh, future. And there's sort of a corollary of this around environmental justice, that um, there's this big issue of equity, right, of both intergenerational equity, that our uh, addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is putting future generations in, in harm's way, um, and geographic, that, you know, it's us in the wealthy world and our consumption practices that are really leading to increased vulnerability, the nutritional outcomes I've been talking about in places where the CO2 emissions are you know, a tiny fraction of our own. And so there, there are some really important issues of ethics and equity that, that come out from this. I'm not gonna talk a lot about this. I think you all know what's happening in agricultural research. I'm so thrilled that Tufts is here, I think it's the greatest strength in uh, the Boston Cambridge area. I think, um, you know, I talked to Tim Griffin a lot about what he's doing at the Friedman School. I'm really excited about the bread lab that's being developed and um, all of the energy around creating new crop strains and figuring out how to address more nutritious diets. There's a huge amount that can be done to address all of these challenges that I'm talking about. There's a ton to do around agricultural intensification and just becoming much more efficient in our use of these agricultural inputs, whether it's fertilizer or energy or water or land. Um, there's a ton to be done around um, 
just managing our natural systems more conservatively across the board, whether it's fisheries or, or the climate system. Um, there's a lot of research that needs to be done, not only to increase yields, but also increase nutritional quality of uh, foods and increase resilience to these kinds of environmental changes. Um, obviously, a lot of work to be done around behavioral science of what drives the dietary change that we're going to need to see to address some of these problems, and research that's you know, really critical around different ways of, of producing uh, food, both uh, agriculturally and fish and livestock. So um, the good news is that even if none of these things are happening the way I say they are, a lot of the things that I'm suggesting we do would be good things for us to do anyway, so there's not a whole lot lost. Um, obviously, all the work that I've been talking about is um, the product of tons of other people. Uh, this is a sort of um, failed attempt to get uh, you know, even the vast majority of collaborators that I work with. What's interesting to me is just that it takes a lot of disciplines to sort of uh, ask and answer these kinds of uh, questions. And finally, an invitation to all of you to, um, who are interested to come visit the Planetary Health Alliance website um, and to join us and uh, get our newsletters and be part of our uh, community. And with that, I will finish. Thank you. Agreed to answer a few of questions course, yeah. or to dis course, enter a yeah. discussion. I thought there would be a few hands. <laughs> Alice? Uh, very interesting. Um, I was particularly interested in the protein and, and iron and nutrient. Was there an impact of the CO2 on water retention in the process? On water retention? I don't know if that was evaluated. We could go back <laughs> to the primary data. I don't remember them. How would they measure water retention? Is that, would, would that be? I think these were dry. I mean, I think what we were analyzing were dried um, grains. So. Okay, well, the reason, because what yeah. I'm getting at is if, you know, I have to be quite picky about the link between the level of CO2 and the amount of protein, um, iron, or zinc. But if there was a higher level of water retention, <coughs> Yeah, so that gets at this question of mechanism and what's, what's going on in these crops. And um, you're proposing sort of a dilution, literally a dilution well, in, this, in this case. In yeah, and I don't think that's what's going on here. I think that's, I mean, th this issue of mechanism has been looked at um, fairly exhaustively, but no one's been able to figure it out. So I spent two years with this um, postdoc who was a physician, but also a PhD plant physiologist, and we were trying to see what our data could say about the different hypotheses that were out there. What's kind of interesting, we published a supplemental table in that first nature paper, and we looked at not just iron and zinc, but a whole variety of other minerals. And there are things like boron and selenium and magnesium and things that I didn't really know what to do with as a physician. But they were all doing different things. And there were some that were going up and some that were going down, and it varied between different crop types. And so what we concluded was, because there is this, this the hypothesis out there that's not water dilution, but it's carbohydrate dilution, that the plant's just making more starch and it's diluting everything else out. And we said, you know, it's got to be more complicated than that, because if it was just a dilutionary mechanism, then all the nutrients should be falling at roughly the same level, and that's not what we were seeing. So there must be something else going on, but we couldn't figure out what. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, this is 
Yeah, no, so there are a few different things there, and we're merging into territory that's not my area of expertise. Um, we did test phytate because we were interested in zinc and we needed to know what was happening to phytate, and there were no significant changes in phytate. Um, but this issue of yields definitely came up. And um, sure, sure, and that was looked at. Um, there, one of the issues, though, is I don't think we really resolve that this is all just increased starch yield, right? That this is, that there's just more starch and it's washing everything else out. But even if that were the case, there's this issue of stoichiometry, right? That if you're eating wheat and rice and, you know, 70% of your calories, like in the population of India, are coming from cereals, and that's your source of these nutrients, and now suddenly you need to eat, you know, 10% more, right? Th that's not going to help with metabolic disease in India. So yeah. So um, the other thing I point yeah. out is I think your estimates of what this are didn't play into extension, didn't consider the bioavailability. And iron in particular, it's probably only two or just maybe five percent of that is is actually absorbable, absent some trace of some other diet, which would mean your estimate of six percent change becomes more. Well, with zinc, w yeah, I mean, so with our zinc study, we very specifically looked at bioavailable zinc, which is why we tested phytate in every one of our samples, and then we used the Miller equation to calculate bioavailable zinc. With iron, we weren't actually calculating absorption of iron, so we were just saying, how does dietary iron change? and not how does absorbable dietary iron change. So you're right, I mean, it, it may be a misestimate, there's no question. It's not a misestimate of how dietary iron was, or at least it's, I, I, I believe it's as accurate an estimate as we can get of what's happening to dietary iron. What that actually means for dietary insufficiency with iron, I'm not quite sure, yeah. I'm curious, with any of Yeah, no, that's a, it's a perfect question, and the answer is nowhere near enough. So um, I think there are a few experiments that are just kind of getting going in some of the um, lower income countries. Um, none of the experiments that we did were specifically in the countries that ended up having the highest, uh, highest risk. So, you know, yes, we were conducting rice experiments in Japan, not in Kansas, but it was still Japan, not India. And so that's a huge need, is to um, do a lot more of these face experiments, not only in um, the settings where people are most at risk, but also looking at different soil conditions. You know, what happens in really impoverished soils? These were all sort of ideal soils. And um, if you have these nutrient uh, depleted soils, what does that look like? And we don't know enough about that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah, just, just to be clear, we're projecting not to the next century, but this, the middle of this century, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I just wrote a review paper on that, on the sort of larger question of climate change impacts on food security and crop production. So I just reviewed that literature, and it's not, uh, it's not definitive. The best um, analyses have been done that essentially model the combined effects of a slight positive effect of CO2 that's a direct fertilization effect with then the negative effects of rising temperature and changes in precipitation patterns. And when they bring those together, there's, there are big uncertainty bars, but the estimates are you know, 15 to 25 percent reductions in yields of uh, maize and wheat in the tropics. Um, now, so that's, that's the area that's most at risk, less in terms of uh, rice uh, and some of the other crops. So I think the answer is we're not quite sure. The, the, the other estimate that's already out there is that since 1980, we've seen 5% reduction in what we would have, the sort of counterfactual without climate change. So we're already seeing reductions again in, in maize and wheat. Um, 
But I don't think we know. I mean, this whole area of how climate change is a bigger issue of all the, you know, issue how all the different aspects of climate change, from impacts on temperature and precipitation to um, pests and pollinators to agricultural labor, which is a huge issue, um, how all those things collectively, the natural hazards, are going to interact to reduce or augment crop yields in different parts of the world is still really uncertain. But um, you know, the, the consensus is that it's it's a negative effect. Uh, but I don't think we can quantify. Yeah. I want to sneak in a question yeah. here. Um, how are you assessing uh, the CO2 level in the atmosphere? Uh, and are, you're using one figure, are you? Because it's quite clear when you travel to certain venues uh, that it's not all, the world isn't all at the same level. So um, that's right, um, you know, and certainly if we measured it right here in downtown Boston, we'd get a higher level than the global average, just there, there are these urban um, effects from where it's being emitted. So I'm sort of referencing something like Mauna Loa, where there's a, a global observatory that's been following CO2, you know, with these very, very precise measurements every year going, what's called the Keeling curve, going way back, um, you know, really over 100 years. Um, and so there is a sort of an accepted measurement for global average CO2. Um, we just passed 400 a few years ago, and you know we're around 402 right now. Um, and I'm not thinking about so much specific local changes. So when we say 550, we know that in those fields, that's what we've got. Um, but we're projecting 550 as an average for the, for the globe in 40 or 50 years. So a place like China could have a, Bigger. Well, you know, it's not really that. It's not. It's much more at the um, fine grain level, like Beijing. But right. China as a whole, I mean, big land masses are right. going to essentially. I mean, there's there's very rapid mixing at the level of you know large land mass. So CO2 is pretty consistent. I mean, it's, China's not going to be consistently well above the United States. Um, so it's it's going to be fairly uh, homogeneous. Okay. No, is the answer to that. Nor do we look at how different amino acids are changing in response to CO2, which is probably an even larger deficiency in our research in that, um, and, and I've sort of, I'm curious to go back to do that. But what I actually talk to people who knew a lot about protein metabolism, they bring up all these issues and say, well, you know, the real issue is what happens to like the limiting um, amino acid in a particular uh, grain crop, although that's then, you know, uh, altered in some extent if you've got a more diverse diet. And so, but no, this was just gross measurements of protein because that's what we could afford to right, do at the time. Yeah, no, that's right. And it seems like there's something about being a legume and fixing nitrogen that makes them uh, much less susceptible. Yeah. Is anybody doing? Um, well, so there are lots of parts to that question. There is a little bit of research being done in some other plants. Uh, there's a guy actually uh, in the ARS named Lou Ziska down in Maryland um, who's been doing some really interesting work on CO2 and crops, and I think he's done some fruits and vegetables um, as well. He also did a really neat experiment, which uh, 
um, got at this question of whether we were already experiencing nutrient impoverishment in our uh, food system, which I get asked a lot. So, okay, we're at 400, we were at 280 pre-industrial. How much have we already experienced that? Maybe that's part of why we have two billion people who are iron zinc deficient. Um, and it's a very hard thing to ask uh, in um, crop research because the cultivars have changed so rapidly. I mean, every three or four years, that you can't go back and look at longitudinal data and see, although Lou's thinking about a way to maybe get at that. But what he did was he looked at goldenrod. And that's a plant that we haven't messed with, uh, at least not intentionally. Um, and he looked at archived samples from Museums of Natural History going back to the 1850s and found that there was a linear, uh, very clear, uh, reduction in the protein content of goldenrod pollen down to 33% by uh, today. So we've had a one-third loss of the protein content of uh, goldenrod pollen. Now that's really interesting in its own right. And then he actually reproduced that effect in the laboratory by growing goldenrod at high CO2 and reproduced the exact same curve. Um, so that's interesting in its own right. It's also really interesting because it connects these two places that I've been doing research, right, on CO2 and pollinators, because goldenrod is this ubiquitous, late-flowering plant that's actually super important for overwintering for a lot of bees and other pollinators, and they're consuming that pollen to overwinter. Now, if the pollen's lost a third of its protein, what does that do to the viability of the pollinators, and I'm actually working with a postdoc right now to start doing some experiments on you know, low protein diets and bees and what that does to their services. So um, to be continued, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. Well, uh, I would like to thank you very much and recommend that people go to the planetaryhealthalliance.org to find out about this organization Thank you so much.